Welcome to the best of Homes on Homes. My job is to fix houses, especially ones with bad repairs or renos done by contractors who just don't do the job right. When you've been doing this for as long as I have, you think you've seen it all. But let me tell you, there are some things that even surprise me. Unique, unusual, call them whatever you want. Something completely different, that's for sure. Nice. Awesome. Look at the mess. They got a nest of them. Yeah, baby. If you're going to do it, do it right the first time. My hero. It's perfect. On the money. Thank you, guys. You like it? Oh, do I ever do? One of the best things about traveling around and helping people is that I get a chance to see how homes are built to work in different environments. One massive challenge was New Orleans, where temperatures can hit 100 degrees easy. And when it rains, it pours. We were in New Orleans helping with one of the first homes to be built in the Lower Ninth Ward. Gloria Guy had been waiting a long time in temporary housing. I'm looking forward to moving into the house where I could have space to hang my clothes and do the things I wanted to, and I'd be happy. The plan was to build Gloria a house, but build it smart, and smart is capturing the rainwater because they get a lot of it down there. For things like flushing the toilet or watering the plants, your grass, etc. So we installed the cistern tank to collect it. The strange thing was the tank was a concrete burial box. Remember, New Orleans is below sea level. It's not common to bury people in the ground. They use these concrete boxes as graves. Okay, it was weird, but it worked, and it was a creative solution. We installed downspouts to collect the rainwater and a pump, and there you go. Water the garden, wash the car, using all that rainwater makes sense to me. All right, we're gonna be loading the scaffold onto the forklift and moving it out of the way. And then we'll be working the rest of the way through the day around the house as we go and we get areas freed up to be able to work on. John Sater was one of the main guys there that's a really a genius and a guy that I love to work with. He came up with the idea of using pervious concrete for the driveway. This allows water to go right through it. It totally made sense to me because I saw it rain there and man, it pours big time like nothing I've ever seen. It's like a dry pack. It's can... a dry pack. Awesome. And yet we can uh, allow water to actually bleed right through water it. Water will go through it at five to eight gallons a minute per square foot. One square foot of this equal one square foot of green. Same as grass. Same as grass. I heard about this, so I brought a bottle of water. There you go. I just poured it, just poured it on just top. Poured it on top. Look at it, it's absorbing it. If you look at the bottom, it's coming out in a lot more places. Oh my God. That is ingenious. Back in Canada, we have freeze thaw. If we, if, if there's water in it, which concrete will absorb the water, it freezes, it pushes, it breaks it. This is a big problem we have up north. How, how about using this? Well, water expands when it freezes. You got voids in pervious concrete. And those board, that's, the water is going to seat the easiest route to go to. So in other words, it's not going to break it. It's not going to break it. Because it allows expansion it allows within it. Allows expansion within itself. Stormwater management, that makes sense. There was no end to the systems we developed just because of the climate. There is a bathtub in the front of my property. This is a modular marsh. Uh, this is a, a flexible stormwater management system that a variety of collaborators through the Make It Right organization helped develop to encourage innovative stormwater management practices in the Lower Ninth Ward. Any runoff off the street then we'll fill this modular marsh up and we'll have wetland plantings in here that can live in a wet climate or a dry climate. So in theory, these become miniature modular detention systems so that we don't overload the storm system that drains down there that needs to be pumped out. Which is, appears to be overloaded over and over Absolutely. again. Absolutely. We're gonna fill it with large gravel, then we're gonna put filter fabric, okay. and then top it with wetland plantings. So in, all you will see is just the rim or the definition of this system, and it'll be full of rain garden plants. Brilliant. By the end, we really wanted to make this perfect for Gloria. So we put down sod, made flower beds, and planted some cactus. 
since she loved those so much. We also gave her enough room in the yard for new vegetable garden to replace the one that Katrina had wiped out. I just wanted to show you the backyard for a minute. All right. This is the cistern. This is just to collect the rain water so you can water your grass. Everything will be explained to you later. Right. But we're just here to see the place. Look at your backyard. Beautiful. Isn't that nice? Oh, yeah, y'all did a beautiful job. So what is it with you and cactus? I just love them, you know, because when I was at, out there in Georgia, I used to like to see the way they grow. And I wind up with another little tree I brought back from Georgia. OK. And it was like a baby. And now I got it big. It's on the porch. I like all that. Does this work? Yeah, that's pretty. Every day I dream of, I'm telling you. Because you see, they have the cactus with, like, the tropical flowers, I call it. And they are pretty. And then they have the other little flowers. I like all that. I like to do God work. So I really enjoy it. And also, I thank God for my calls and his crews, because they did a beautiful job in building this place from the ground on up. And he's going down in history, because my house will be an example for the history. And I will be an example for the history. I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. In Sylvia and Guy's house, even if you were a fly on the wall, you would need earplugs. We have the quietest neighbors, but you can still hear the, the steps, the talking, the kids. Every wall that joins to your neighbor is going to have to be opened up and inspected. And we're going to find out why. Welcome back to the best of Homes on Homes. We're showing you some of the most unique and unusual jobs we've dealt with in over 100 episodes. And considering the things that I've seen, it was definitely a unique challenge when I had to solve a problem that I couldn't see. Anyone living in an attached or a semi-detached home knows that it can get really noisy, but this is something completely different. When we first moved in, we were gonna stay for five, 10 years, but the neighbors actually moved in maybe a month or so after we About moved in. So, yeah. And I can just remember when they started moving in, my heart just sank. I couldn't believe that I just bought a house and I could hear them so clearly. The neighbors weren't being loud. They were just talking. But to Sylvia, it sounded like they were in the same room. SDC, or sound transmission class, measures how much sound a wall absorbs. There are minimal code requirements, but you know what I say, minimum code isn't enough. Only two months in their new home, and they were ready to move. Sylvie, nice to see you again. Guy, Hi, Mike. nice to see you. We uh, have talked to the neighbors, and they've told us that they can, they can hear us, and they can actually tell what type of music is on when we play it. Yeah, I, I definitely hear things. I, I hear uh, mostly in my bedroom and uh, in the kitchen. This is the joining wall? Yes, yeah. it is. OK. Is it up to the builder to make sure that it's soundproof? No. I don't see insulation, but I do see something over there. It's up to the builder to make sure that it's minimum code requirement. Way in the corner there, I'm seeing a little bit of insulation. Interesting. At a minimum code of 50 on the STC scale, it's supposed to be acceptable that you can barely hear your neighbor. Odds are you're still going to hear your neighbor if they raise their voice, they turn up the stereo, they get into an argument, they put a nail in the wall you're going to hear it. Normally, when you have a, an adjoining house like this, we'll have a two by six bottom plate, two by six top plate, stagger the studs, come in with insulation. It's supposed to do a sound break. As soon as there's a stoppage, in other words, I put my hands together like this, sound will travel from one side to the other. But as soon as I separate them, sound dissipates. That sounds hollow, isn't it? Sylvie was painting, and she could hear Sylvie painting with the roller going over the wall in the bedroom. And I could hear this roller blush going up and down and up and down. Their bedrooms are right next to our bedroom. And just a roller going up and down, she could hear that. The bad news is, is obviously we have a sound issue. And in order to address and fix this, you're going to have to remove your island. All your furniture is going to have to come out. We're going to have to tent off galore. And every wall that joins to your neighbor is going to have to be opened up and inspected. And we're going to find out why. Before I started tearing down walls, I needed to get a measure on how much sound was actually getting through. So I brought in a pro. And this is a decibel meter. OK. And it'll just register the amount of sound that's, uh, that's happening as a result of uh, OK, now I'm, I've, I've set this for full blast. All right. OK. So Okay, 
That's uh, probably enough. What'd you get? Yeah, we got between about 84 and 86. I think it averaged out around 85, something like that. Okay, and that's picking up my voice. So as I'm talking, we're in the area of 70, 69. That's correct. This will tell us how much sound that the wall is not absorbing right. or, or taking over. This is supposed to be a minimum 50 STCs. That's correct. Well, let's see what we have. Okay. Yeah, I'm almost here. Okay, I'm here, Mike. Okay, here we go. We're going to do the same thing. Just give it about three seconds, and it'll come on and blare my ears off. It's not that loud, though. Okay, did you get that? Yeah, we got about uh, 47 to uh, 49. Sometimes we even hit 50. The wall's supposed to be stopping about 46 STCs. And we had, I believe, about uh, 80 on the other side, 85. So we're shy on what we should be getting for a staggered wall. That's correct. When we did the test upstairs in the bedroom, it actually met code. But what good is code when you can even hear your neighbor painting? I was showing a unique drywall product that would stop a lot of the noise from filtering through. Okay, now this is the drywall you're talking about. This stuff here will be the equivalent of eight layers of drywall. That's correct. When the NRC tested this, that's what their uh, comments were, acoustically speaking. And uh, the trick here is not the actual metal that's inside, but it's the polymer, the viscoelastic polymer that's on both sides of it, which actually convert acoustic energy into heat, which you can't hear, and nor could you feel that. The soundproofing drywall was the perfect solution. Even though the bedroom walls were up to code, I wanted to give a little more privacy. So we added a layer of this new drywall right over the existing wall. But in the kitchen, it was a different story. The sound barrier was so weak, I had to see what was there or not there. That meant taking the kitchen apart. Pull the wall down. Yeah. Well, that's their wall right there. Oh, wait a minute. We have a double wall. This is, again, showing me the builder cares about what they're doing. They did a double-studded wall rather than a 2 by 6 bottom plate and top plate and staggered studding. When I'm visually looking through the hole, I could see the distance in the back. This would equal a 2 by 6 distance. Right away, I'm thinking they did staggered studding, which they can do. But in this case, because it's a double wall, and I remember now one of the neighbors saying to me that my neighbor got insulation, but I didn't. And minimum code here was as long as one of them is insulated, the other one doesn't have to be. Okay, so that's a good sign. We see that they have insulated on the other side. I can see it over there. I'm no longer going to harm their side. That's where the sound came from. So I'm gonna take this piece, we're gonna plaster it back in place. There's the next door neighbor right there. On the other side of this, you're going to see the same thing we saw here. Remember, we also saw, and I can see insulation in there. So that's good. Good thing is, we have a double wall. We have drywall in between, so fire rating is good. We have insulation on this side. For some strange reason, they ran out of uh, <laughs> drywall and decided to insulate this area. This would now explain why we can hear the music so loud on downstairs in the kitchen and not upstairs in the bedroom. <laughs> we also used another great product. It's almost like a putty as a sound wrap for the outlet boxes. And what this does is it stops any sound from coming through the box itself. We're going to add, instead of the pinky insulation that we saw, we're going to add the safe and sound product. So now we have two in one. We have one for sound, two for fire. This must be minimum code requirement when it comes in between two houses. But it's not, because one layer of drywall on this side, one layer of drywall on the neighbor's side, it gives you one hour burning time, minimum code requirement. We need that dead air space, which you see across here, which now when sound will travel through the drywall, hit the stud, now dissipates in between the two areas because it's got nowhere to go. You do one thing wrong, we have a sound issue, and someone's going to scream. Well, you don't have to worry about putting any seal on this, because when you go through, there's polymer inside the drywall that'll coat the screw as it goes through. So it'll lock everything so it'll in. So it'll lock everything in. You right. don't have to worry about hanging a picture or anything like that, because it'll do the same thing to the nail. So you can, it's just like normal drywall when it's done.
Usually when we finish a big job, we get that wild wow. But with this job, we needed to give it back the same way it looked, but only quieter. Did we make it right? Take a listen. How is it? You have it on? Can't hear it. No, it's not reading anything on this side over here, except when I'm talking. Sorry to keep you waiting. Come on no in. Problem, no problem. Make sure you take your shoes off. We cleaned up. Yeah, thank you. See? <laughs> nice. Obviously, you know you're not going to see one hell of a difference, really, because we've chosen the same paint. We found an opening in the middle. That's the crossover. And this is why we had so much sound coming through the kitchen compared to upstairs. So obviously, we uh, closed it off. We made sure that we drywalled that section, soundproofed the whole, whole wall with safe and sound uh, insulation, and then put up the new Quiet Rock. It sounds dead in here now. It's different sound. You noticed it? Yeah. yeah. Homeowners out there don't want to hear their neighbor. They don't want to smell the greasy food cooking next door. And odds are they'll pay an additional 2,000, 3,000, up to five, depending on the soundproofing. And let's talk about air in between the two homes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, you keep smiling. Everything. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy it, all right? We're staying put. Yeah, we're staying put. Expect the unexpected, they say. Oh, here we are. Here we are, guys. I came in to fix brickwork, but as soon as I walked in the home, I knew we had something completely different on our hands. The bricks? That's nothing. Welcome back to the best of Homes on Homes. Today we're showing you highlights of some of the strangest things that I've seen. Things we can only call something completely different. Usually when I'm called into a job, it's bad electrical, bad plumbing structure, you name it. But what made this job different wasn't actually behind the walls, it was in front of them everywhere. Let's start at the beginning with the brickwork outside. Val? How are you? Dave, nice to see you again. Nice. Well, come on out, let's take a look at this brick. When we first came and looked at the house, it was, I guess it was March or snow, okay? So we didn't see the bottom rows of brick. Brick. What's the problem? It's falling apart, it's deteriorating. After the deal went through, we started seeing the brick kind of flaking, flaking. And it's falling apart, literally, like in all your vertical everywhere here. Yeah. Every winter since then, I guess because of snow against it, water being absorbed by these poor bricks, more flakes off, more flakes off until you see the holes. That's not good. No, not when I can take my finger and do that. The brickwork was in really bad shape, and I knew fixing it was going to be a big job. But I noticed a lot of condensation buildup on the inside of their windows. I went in to take a look, and it was obvious we were dealing with something different. Oh, here we are. Here we are, guys. When I first walked in the front door, I took a step, I looked around. First words out of my mouth were, are you moving? Because <laughs> I thought you were moving. Because there's a lot of stuff everywhere and it looks like it's not staying. Wow, you're really full. This family hadn't thrown anything out in a very long time. And when the registers are covered up all over the house, the air can't flow. This isn't healthy. Even a house needs to breathe. So everything just got backed up. Work five days a week, come home every night. We'd get home around 7.30 or 8, and there wasn't time to do anything. There was just literally no time. And things start just start to back up and build up. I don't think that uh, this family has thrown anything out other than food waste in many, many years. That's OK, uh, I think. <laughs> but uh, that's covered up all the registers. It's uh, stopped the airflow. And I don't think it's very healthy living. I knew something was wrong coming up to the house when I could see the condensation in the windows. And right away, I'm thinking heating, air movement. Yes. Where's your furnace room? Furnace room is through the back. Through the back here. Uh, OK. Very good. Well, we're going to have problems getting in there. Come on back upstairs. <laughs> well, I'm going to start looking throughout your house to find out why we have bad airflow. 
You have stuff everywhere. I need you to help me move things. To fix the air problem, a lot of this stuff had to go. So we asked Dave and Val, please give us some space. Piano. How do you like that, eh? We have found 1909 first-year cover stamps and things. I mean, this is unbelievable. These are all the things that are going to go to the children in the Philippines. Well, these are rollers for painting. It's just a matter of throwing it out like that. Things that aren't, aren't precious. They, they can only be precious as long as you have someplace to put them. They're not precious anymore if you can't put them anywhere. Val dug in with some of the sorting and cleaning and getting rid of some of the stuff, but when I came back, it was only a little better. And it looks like you have done one hell of a lot of cleaning in here. Yes. Okay, but I want to offer uh, some assistance. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's totally up to you. And I think sometimes when we get so close to what's in the house, we don't want to get rid of it. So here's my offer. I want to bring in all my people, uh, all my bins. I want to put on gloves and everything, and I want to go through everything in the basement. And we're going to do it one day. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anything, holy cow. Anything that is in a bin, take it out, dump it. Where do you want to start? First, it's a fire hazard. If there was a fire, God forbid, most of the hallways, windows, the stairs, they'd all be blocked. No way to escape. I give up. OK. I'm fishing around for the silverware set. Star Wars, the collectibles. OK, I caught something. Second, it's a health hazard. There was so much stuff sitting there for years, the mice were all over it. I had never seen so much mouse droppings in my life. So not only do we have bad airflow issues, there was mouse poop everywhere. Think about what the air quality must have been like in that home. Healthy? Not a chance. Uh, the funny part is, this was the small room. <laughs> It's always a happy day at the end. It always is. I think for me personally, this was not only a change of what happened in the home, but what happened in their lives. I took a lot of stuff out of that house. I've never seen anything like that in my life. I don't want to knock these people because they're truly good people. I think life has a way of making things happen. Maybe you start to get used to a cycle and all of a sudden, you know, it just gets overwhelming. That was a good incentive for us. So. And we want to now get the floors finished down there and um, get rid of the old carpet. Just things that we had planned to do um, a roof and a chimney and a eaves trough ago. <laughs> so now it's time to do it. Sit down, enjoy the fire, have yourselves a drink. And I'll see you on the next one. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Keep smiling. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll see you. They say that truth is stranger than fiction. Who would have thought a septic tank would lead me to some good old fashioned magic? All right, I'll find that water line. Don't you worry. Holy man. Welcome back to the best of Homes on Homes. We're looking at the best of the strangest, and whether it's technology, techniques, or technicians, our next job had it all. Jim and Allison dreamed of living in the country, but after having triplets, they needed an addition on their home. Unfortunately, their contractor never finished what he started. Work slowed until finally he just stopped showing up. By the time I got there, I saw how much work needed to be done. We're not finished. This is where it starts. This is where it starts. This is the old home, and you put on the addition. At some point, you think, what can we do? You're sort of just left, you know, with having to figure it out yourself. The brickwork was incomplete, the foundation was a disaster, and the bathroom wasn't even finished. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. The building inspector broke the news. If you build a bigger house, you need a bigger septic system. Additions are all about doing the math. How many bathrooms? How many taps? How many sinks? This indicates how big the septic tank needs to be. If we change the septic tank to upgrade it, do we have to also do all the weeping? It all depends on the calculations that the code tells us what, uh, what our design flow is. We base that on what I was telling you before about the number of bedrooms and the square footage of the house, fixture units, and then the other key item that we're going to need to identify is the soil type. 
Then John says he has to find the old septic bed. And what does he do? He pulls out a pair of divining or witching rods. There's that. our line there. Twice in a row, same spot. I've, I've heard about this, but seeing it is something else. I'm watching him with these rods, and part of me is thinking, OK. And then if we keep going, if I don't get another one right about here, then we know we're still working on the sewer line going from the tank. I'm still not buying it, but I'm watching. And he's getting real specific now. And then he does it again. He's finding all the water lines incoming and outgoing. OK, so here's our network of lines for our disposal bed. I'm seeing this happen right in front of me. I'm thinking, no way. And he does it again. You can see that three there. There's four. OK, OK. I got to try this. There they go. Holy crap. Now, I've heard of this. It's like you're completing a circuit. It, uh... Is it science, energy fields, moisture content, magic? Who knows? But I saw it. It's how they used to find underground water, whether it was digging a well or finding an underground water stream. It still works. I don't know why, but it does. Yeah, there was five from where I started. Now, there may be I don't believe one. this. This is weird. That blows me away. <laughs> All right, I'm sold. If we're talking cordless power tools, these were something completely different. Well, now you can do it. So these are yours. You can keep Well, them. thank you. All right. You can see me walking around, eh, for you. All right, I'll find that water line. Don't you worry. <laughs> Holy man. Once we found the lines for the septic tank, all we had to do was dig it up and replace it. It's a little smelly. Yeah, that's just a little smelly. <laughs> what we've got is, <clears throat> if you look at the exit pipe, which would exit the septic tank, yeah. it's half full of water. That pipe should technically be empty with the water slowly dribbling out into the disposal field. Meaning either we're blocked, full, uh, it's not weeping. It means we're due anyway. It's just old enough now that it's now full of biological material and it can't accept any more liquid. So what we'll do is we'll just start the excavation for the new tanks. We'll decommission the old tank while we're at it. Let's do it. All right. This is where we're going to dig the trench to pick up the two downspouts, one at this side, one at this side. It will allow and pick up the water from the driveway as well as the roof and direct it that way rather than bring it into the house. Grade runs into the house this way. That's an issue. Plus the downspouts, let's keep the water away from the foundation. It's a self-leveling laser, so we can set the heights on the tank so we don't set it too deep or too high. But it's one that we just turn on and it levels itself, and then we always do from there to set the heights. The tank has to be level because there's only two inches difference from the inlet and the outlet. So if we put it in two inches the wrong way, the water won't go out the tank. It'll come back into the house. Okay. And Mother Nature decides to dump a good six inches of snow on our job site. We still had to install the weeping bed for the septic system. That's where the water from the tank seeps into the ground. The first thing I notice is that you're actually higher than the septic tank. Right. What we're going to do is we're going to dose from the treatment unit. It, it will then flow by gravity into the pump chamber, and then we'll come up and we'll dose this, this bed. We've got solid pipes on each end. And if you look here, all the weeping. There's a weeping network of pipes along this pipe. So it'll fill the pipe, and then it'll all come out of those holes at the same level and down into the bed. Now, how much earth? There's Bucky. How you doing, pal? How much earth do we have on top of this? Uh, well, when we're all finished here, we'll, we'll have stone up to about here, and then we'll have somewhere between four and eight inches of, of topsoil on top. you got to like this. I, I just can't believe how much work this is. We started off with the witching rods. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, that was talk about old fashioned, and then boom. <laughs> I win. This was an impressive system, and it was more than big enough for the addition. I knew Jim and Allison would appreciate it. I know I would. Actually, I wanted one for myself. How you doing? It is very cool. Welcome to my home. <laughs> we find you have a septic upgrade. Okay, how many toilets do you have? We start counting four. So we, we call in our very good friends, John and John. 
Both of them came in and put in a super, I'm telling you, sophisticated unit that I've never before seen. I want one in my house now that I've seen it. That was well like done. the lottery. <laughs> that was like the for lottery, us, yeah, for us. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. While trying to install a water conservation solution, we discovered someone beat us to it by about 100 years, give or take. Does anybody ever get a feeling that there might be something in the ground here? I'm just wondering if we should, like, maybe go fishing. <laughs> Welcome back to the best of Homes on Homes. We're looking at the jobs from our Believe It or Not files. What I'd like to call something completely different. In all my time as a contractor, I've seen all kinds of surprises. And Chris Neor's story was no exception. A renovation with plumbing disasters left, right, and center. And a chance to look into the past. Installing a sump pump is usually a simple job. Your pipe just comes outside the wall, drops the water right back to the weeping and back into the house. Or you can do what we did and run it into a trench underground, away from the house, into a dry pit. People don't know about uh, dry well systems. Actually, it's very old technology. They've used uh, dry wells to use for hundreds of years. When everybody used to have cistern uh, systems, they used to collect all the rainwater and they would use whatever water they could for around the house, feeding the animals. Now go figure, we did this hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And we don't do it anymore. No, it works well, Mike. Uh, boy, we used these very successful for uh, years. And, well, it sure uh, beats running it outside the house and putting it right back in the foundation again. Well, yeah, you, you, and, and it is a problem when you're doing additions and that, and the city does uh, require a sump box uh, installation. That is the problem. Where Why is it not minimum code to bring it away from the house? Now it's minimum code to pull your downspouts out. It's within code anyways. No longer in the weeping system. So if we're trying to divert all the water away from the house, why did they make the code that you can drop the sump pump right outside of the foundation Well, wall? I'm not exactly sure, but uh, for some reason, the city, uh, the building department, stops short of putting in a sump box. They won't tell you where to exhaust it to, or how to exhaust it, or any that information is just not available from them. We're going uh, about uh, 24 inches deep here for the exhaust line. OK. We're going to be approximately 40 feet away, eh? Run through. Yep. I see you've already pulled up the stone two feet down, and all I've got to do is go inside and access that. And I'll wait till we dug down so we get that direct run. I don't want to put it in too, right. too deep. I wait for you, yep. and I'll redrill this. Well, like I said, be, we'll be coming out of that wall about uh, two feet below grade, 24 inches below grade. OK. The only thing that didn't go to plan was when we ran into a bit of history. The guys found a hole in the ground here, and uh, this is really interesting. I've never in my life seen it. This appears to be an old dry well where water goes into. It is massive. It is so big, it is brick. And it's the same brick as the house, so it was done at the same time. It is about this big. You're at the bottom? OK, so that's rock there, right? Wow. It's a freshwater containment unit of some kind. It has nothing to do with the sanitary or the drains or anything like okay, that. What's that? That was probably a breather vent that came up to here. Is yeah. that ever interesting? See how they built the brick up and created it, staggered into the top for the yep. opening? Yep. What this is is an old cistern system. The elevation of this line here probably used to take all the rainwater that would come off the structure, and it would go here. When it filled up, it would flow out into that ditch on the outside. Now, they might have even been using this water for gardening, uh, that type of thing, uh, around the house uh, before all the infrastructure was done uh, in the uh, streets, and they filled up all the ditches and put in all the proper sanitary drains, everything like that. This right. line that comes up here, I'll put my money on it. There was a pump here. Oh, absolutely. And they would pump the water to, water to use this water. Yep. They would use this around the yard. And uh, at, back when they built these houses uh, after the war and that, there, there would be no way that they would use tap water for watering the gardens or anything like that. They would have still been using the uh, same old technology of well water. If we can collect it and use it, let's use it. I can't believe that's exactly how what well this, uh, it was is for. preserved. Amazing, eh? Try to lay it in in pieces if we can, not uh, all in one big pile. Well, that was another first for me. Sadly, we couldn't reuse the cistern, so we filled it in to prevent a sinkhole. A few years later, on a different job, we had a chance to install a modern cistern. It did the same thing as the old one, but with no hand pump. 
Okay, I'll bring it down to you. Conserving water isn't a new idea. Our ancestors knew better than to waste water. Using gray water today makes sense because it conserves our clean water. And as a homeowner, you're saving every time it rains. You'd be saving for a rainy day with a rainy day. One green solution can go a long way. And when I got the chance to design a green home from the bottom up, I knew we were going to do something big. Gotta love this. Welcome back to the best of Homes on Homes. You know, over the years, we've helped a lot of people, but with this next house, this was the worst I'd ever seen, seriously. I knew I needed to step in and help this family. It was kind of clear to me that no one else was going to. But this time, it was also my chance to build something completely different. Joe and Christina's situation really blew me away. They wanted a second story addition to their bungalow. They hired a contractor for the job, a friend of the family, and as a result, they ended up financially and emotionally devastated. Two years into the job and it wasn't anywhere near finished, but it gets worse. The job was so bad, it would cost more to fix it than to build a new one. We had the chance to get rid of this big mistake, so what did we do? We tore it down. I have never in a million years seen one home have so many problems. I had a little gulp, but now I'm okay. <laughs> I'm pretty excited. Pretty excited. It's being euthanized. We needed to put it out of its misery, it's true. <laughs> it's helping. All right, let's be serious. If I'm gonna build a house and I'm gonna design a house that's better than anything else, we're gonna make it green. It's gonna be fireproof, waterproof, moldproof. Let's think about it. Let's have a, a green roof. Let's make this home so efficient, it stands for itself. Spend your money right, it'll last forever. This house was gonna be state of the art, starting with its foundation. Oh, here's our form boards. All in one, no wood, don't have to take it out. Interior, exterior, weeping system, drainage. I don't know why nobody uses it. We strongly believe in it, it'll do a better job. Everything can be used, every little piece of it can be uh, cut up and used and coupled together. It's lightweight, easy for the guys to handle. Interior, exterior, weeping system. Exactly, you got a double weeping system. Where where else do you get that? No one. You don't, that. yeah. And who wants to put it in the inside? Where the builders are gonna say, oh, that's gonna cost you money. This is in the form. Exactly. This makes it work. Nothing to do with this house's minimum code requirement. Everything to do with it is on the maximum level. I'm trying to build a home that's 10 times better with theory of understanding why. Why are we building it 10 times better? So you never have to spend money in the future. All right, let's do this. Okay, if we're gonna make this the most energy efficient home, we needed to rethink, I mean, everything. These are for water. This is uh, for preheat of our domestic hot water. It allows us to save energy on uh, the domestic hot water load. Should provide about 50 to 65% of your, uh, your hot water during the course of the year. And it's discreetly located and, and gives us a lot of energy efficiency. What are we getting with four panels and the equivalent to wattage? With four panels, you're getting a total of 600 potential watts per hour. Okay, 600 watts per hour. We have how many batteries downstairs? Downstairs, we've got 10,000 watts worth of battery storage. Think of it in terms of a gas tank. Okay. Your fuel tank in the basement are the batteries that will hold 10,000 watts. This will put in 600 watts every hour. Typically, in a 24-hour period, the average house will use between 25 and 35,000 watts running everything. As the panels produce power, if the power is needed in the home, it's used. If it isn't needed, it automatically gets sent back out to the utility, creating a credit on the electrical bill. That's exactly what I wanted. So we have one fancy roof system going in this home. Well, at least over the dome, correct? That's right. The benefits of this is that we're going to put down a breathable paper. Under Lima. OK, then we're building it up for airflow underneath. That's right. OK, and on top of that, we have a special foil that will reflect 
hot and cold. 97%. That's right. It reflects the cold. That's right. And the heat. And the heat. And the summer heat. No ice buildup. That's right. None and whatsoever. We put a guarantee to And that. you guarantee that. That's right. You want a green roof? This was a green roof. A living roof acts as an insulation. It helps keep the house warm in the winter and cool in the summer. It also absorbs rainwater, reducing the amount of runoff. Kind of smart. Building from the ground up gave us the opportunity to make this right in every single way. We were there for about two and a half years and we brought in over 100 pros who helped us build one of the most environmentally friendly homes ever. When it all came together, I was happy to hand over this house to a family who could finally come home. Wow. Follow me. Holy. My. Jump. And just hold me. <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. A little stunning, isn't it? It's so beautiful. Oh my God. I can't. I can't believe this. I lost count of the oh. man, man people, how many people have been in here, but over 100 companies. After you. Oh my gosh. Give him the house back. Give oh, the house back. wow. It's ours again. It doesn't look like our house, that's for sure. You no sure this so. is the right house? Wow. It's so far, so good, eh? This looks really good, but beneath it is 100 times better than what it looks like. It's that's what this house is about. This is the dining room. This is the part that I really love. Oh, my God. How oh, high this ceiling is. This is research and development. That's what it is. You design a prototype that's totally different, that no one's ever built, and put all the theories in together into one basket. All of them. It's not like we just pick one. You know, let's do a green roof. Oh, no, 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 no. We did solar assist in heat, solar assist in hydro. The two panels on the left are solar assist to all the heating in your house. They will constantly take that energy from the sun, heating the water on its own, and the tankless system that we have downstairs that I'll show you, you will not believe the sophisticated <laughs> look of what is down there. Now you heard the story about a green roof. Yes. Well, everybody hears a green roof, but especially that one. Stone all the way around with the parapet that really people cannot see when you're out there. Wait till you see this growing, but it's a slow grower. It's not going to grow it's wild on you. It's going to stay short. By the way, we collect all your rainwater, yeah. which goes into a huge cistern tank on your That's front fantastic. lawn. It flushes your toilets, does your laundry, and waters your grass. I don't know what to say. It's amazing. You don't really think about living in a space like this because it wasn't our reality. It wasn't you know, what we would have envisioned. You'd see it in a magazine, they'd say, oh yeah, that's pretty cool, but it would not be something that you'd envision that you'd be able to live in. So it's it's pretty amazing. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Joe. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, sir. You know what? I like surprises. It keeps things interesting, and it means you can always learn something new. When you're faced with an unusual problem, something completely different, it usually takes different thinking. The solution's there. It just might not be the one you planned on. And that's when the fun really starts, if you do it right. That's to you guys. Okay, come on, everybody. You gotta have at least four. Cheers. 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 To a job well done. For more information about this show, please visit hgtv.ca.